Brothers and sisters, welcome tonight to our Into the Deep session. I am very, very happy to be with all of you tonight. Last time we were together, it was on the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, and today we are on the vigil. Sorry, it was at the Feast of St. Joseph, and today we celebrate the, the vigil of St. Joseph the Worker in this wonderful year of St. Joseph. And um, I'm very grateful to uh, all of you who have joined us tonight for our Into the Deep session, our monthly series of lectures and talks for Seeking Disciples. I'm Sister Angela Marie Castellani, a Franciscan Sister of the Eucharist, and I'm the coordinator for Adult Faith Formation and Catechesis for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. And tonight I'm extremely excited because with me um, are two of my sisters, Sister Demi Marie Savino and Sister Maria Sara Garcia. So tonight is a Francisca evening um, to discover and to uh, open our eyes to a topic that is very dear to us and to many of you and to our Holy Father and the entire church. So um, with today, we end uh, the five year anniversary of the writing of in Laudato Si, the, the Holy Father's encyclical on care for creation. So for um, tonight, we have invited Sister Demi Marie Savino, and her talk is entitled Laudato Si Five Years Later, an intensifying call to ecological conversion and fraternity. And Sister will reflect on the special anniversary of Laudato Si, uh, meaning on care for our common home, and um, the question that we will ask is what new opportunities for ecological convergence and fraternity is the Catholic Church calling forth for all of us as individuals and also for us as a global community? Sister Demi Marie is speaking tonight from Lowell, Michigan. So it is 10 o'clock her time there. So we thank her for um, extending herself um, to the point of speaking almost in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> sister is um, currently serves as the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In this position, she oversees the biology, chemistry, physics, and geography and environmental science department at the college's Center for Sustainability. And Sister received her Bachelor of Science degree in biogeography from McGill University. So there is her connection with Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, her Master of Science degree in soil and plant science from the University of Connecticut, where our Mother House community is located. And then she also has a Master of Arts in theology from the University, the Catholic University of America, where she um, also received her PhD degree in civil environmental engineer from um, the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Sister has lectured and written widely on Laudato Si and creation care, as well as on the themes related to ecological restoration and resilience theory, ecological health, ecology and theology, science and faith. Sister is not new to Vancouver. Maybe some of you remember she was here with us um, about two years ago speaking on a similar topic. And I want to thank Sister Deva Marie is because I was just about new to the Archdiocese and to this work. And I was at her lecture with a lot of my colleagues and many of you. And someone said, oh, this is wonderful. We should have a lecture every month on a topic <laughs> that is interesting to all of us. And so um, truly from Sisters Talk two years ago, our uh, Into the Deep um, series has begun. So from there on, we started a monthly talk. So thank you for the inspiration and for driving that. A request and desire from our own Vancouver people. So welcome Sister Demi Marie with us. And, and tonight we also have Sister Maria Sara Garcia and she is the coordinator for service and justice ministry here at the Archdiocese of Vancouver, also a member of our community. And Sister Maria Sara holds a master in business administration and a postmaster certificate in dogmatic theology. And before coming to Vancouver, she was also in Michigan where Sister Demi Marie is. So here is our little reunion tonight. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited to hear from Sister Demi Marie and explore the themes of her talk tonight. Sister will um, also start us off with a prayer. So thank you for being here with us and enjoy this evening. Welcome, Sister. Thank you very much, Sister Angela Marie. Well, beautiful introduction. And I, I'm very honored to be 
here with you again. I wish I could be here in person, but I'm glad that we have the option to do it this way. So um, I think let's just begin with a prayer and then I'll share my screen because I do have some slides, but I'd like to do the prayer without the screen sharing first. And this prayer is taken from uh, prayers for the season of creation, which I'll mention later on. And it's actually adapted from two places, from the Canticle of the Sun from St. Francis of Assisi and from the writings of St. Hildegard of Bingen. So we, um, we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Most high, all powerful, all good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honor, and all blessings. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no mortal lips are worthy to pronounce your name. Praise to you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, producing varied fruits with colored flowers and herbs. The earth is at the same time mother. She is mother of all that is natural, mother of all that is human. She is the mother of all, for contained in her are the seeds of all. The earth of humankind contains all moistness, all verdancy, all germinating power. It is in so many ways fruitful. All creation comes from it. Yet it forms not only the basic raw material for humankind, but also the substance of the incarnation of God's Son. Praised be you, my Lord, through our mother's sister, through our mother earth, and through Christ our Lord, our risen Savior. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so as, as Sister Angela Murray mentioned, for the past year, we've been in the midst of a global celebration of the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si. The anniversary celebrations were launched on May 24th, 2020, and they will be culminating on May 24th, 2021, with a series of action platforms and initiatives for how to put Laudato Si into practice. The encyclical is as relevant now as it was five years ago, and it has touched people around the world of every race and religion. I've heard that it's actually the most widely read encyclical in the history of the church. And now in the past year, we also have Pope Francis's newest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, on human fraternity, which he released on October 4th, 2020, the Feast of St. Francis, in Assisi, and when he released it, he said these beautiful words, I offered it to God on the tomb of St. Francis, who inspired me to write it, as in the previous Laudato Si. The signs of the times clearly show that human fraternity and care of creation form the sole way towards integral development and peace already indicated by the Pope's St. John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, and John Paul the 2nd. What a beautiful statement, I think, an exhortation for us. And I just want to repeat with that one part, human fraternity and care of creation form the sole way towards integral development and peace. And so in this spirit this evening, I would like to reflect with you as we come to the close of this fifth year anniversary on this intensifying call to ecological conversion and fraternity that the Pope is putting before us. What new opportunities for ecological conversion and fraternity is the Catholic Church calling forth for us as individuals and as a global church community? Now the, the core and heart of the encyclical is the idea of integral ecology. After the Pope considers the science and what's happening to our common home in chapter one, he brings it into dialogue with the, the theology, which he calls the gospel of creation in chapter two. And then he comes back to us humans and um, looks at the human roots deep within us that are actually the cause of the ecological crisis. And then 
After that kind of reflection, he brings us to what he proposes as the solution in chapter four, integral ecology. And then chapters five and six are actually suggestions as to how to approach integral ecology from the macro dimension in chapter five, so politics and economics primarily, and the micro dimension in chapter six in our personal conversion and education and spirituality. And so Pope Francis is proposing that integral ecology is the Catholic Church's answer to the ecological crisis. Now, what, what is integral ecology? It's in his words, the marriage of natural and human ecology. So listening to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, developing solutions that are win-win for both, for both natural ecology and human ecology, rather than benefiting one at the expense of the other. So our intensifying call to ecological conversion and fraternity is to learn how to put integral ecology into practice. And that's what I'd like to focus on this evening. So I'll, I'll begin with a few background points on integral ecology to help us focus our thoughts. And then I'll move into some concretes as to how we can put integral ecology into practice. We'll start with maybe some more local ideas or smaller ideas and then um, end with a major initiative that's coming out of the Vatican called the Laudato Si Action Platform. A little caveat here, there, I will be introducing many different ideas about how to put integral ecology into practice uh, more than any one person or group can do. So I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. These are just ones that I thought were interesting that came across my desk. There, there actually are many others, but my purpose is to stimulate your ideas and give you a sense of like the whole ecosystem of eco integral ecology as I understand it at this time. And then what, what I hope will happen is you might find a niche or one, one of the ideas that really grabs you that you think maybe you could put into practice yourself in your own faith or with your family or your parish. So let's start um, with a little bit of the background on integral ecology. And here I, I would like to make three points, two of them that have a Franciscan foundation. Because in the introduction to Laudato Si, Pope Francis announces that St. Francis of Assisi is an exemplar of the kind of integral ecology that he's talking about in the encyclical. And here he speaks about how St. Francis felt united with all creatures by bonds of affection, which is how he could call them brother and sister. And so these, these bonds of affection are at the heart of why he felt called to care for all that exists. And so my first point about integral ecology is that this notion of care and being called to care is very important. And is this the same as stewardship or is it something different? I remember when I first read the encyclical after, shortly after it came, or actually right before it was formally released, I was struck by that emphasis on care. And I went back and Googled it and it's the word care is used 43 times throughout the encyclical, including in the subtitle, care for our common home. And that's in contrast to stewardship or steward that is only used two times in the encyclical. And then later I came across something from Cardinal Turkson, who's the prefect for the dicastery for the promoting integral human development. And he was closely involved in the preparation of Laudato Si. And he commented on its focus on care for creation rather than on stewardship. And this is what he said. He said, whereas talk of stewardship implies a relationship based on duty, the notion of care taps into something deeper. When one cares for something, it is something one does with passion and, and love. We cannot love God when we do not appreciate or care for what God has made. This is what the Pope wants people to understand. Whatever you want to call the Pope's message, it is essentially an invitation to make our love for God show in what God has made. And so this is an important point that the Catholic message is more about care than it is about stewardship. Not that stewardship isn't a good thing, but as Catholics were called, 
I think even to move beyond that into this kind of Franciscan spirit of care. So we might wanna ask ourselves, how are we each called to care? Now, my second point um, relates to the idea that this type of care has to be grounded in reality and in an honest response to the realities that surround us each day. Pope Francis' uh, famous statement in Evangelium Gaudium that reality is greater than ideas is what I'm thinking of here. It, it's not that ideas are bad, but if they're disconnected from reality, they can become kind of rhetoric or ideology that doesn't really call persons to true action. And Evangelium Gaudium, he says, this principle of reality being greater than ideas has to do with incarnation of the word and it's being put into practice. What calls us to action are realities illuminated by reason. The principle of reality of a word already made flesh and constantly striving to take flesh anew is essential to evangelization. This principle impels us to put the word into practice to perform works of justice and charity, which make that word fruitful. Not to put the word into practice, not to make it reality, is to build on sand, to remain in the realm of pure ideas, and to end up in a lifeless and unfruitful self-centeredness and Gnosticism. So this notion of reality is extremely important, and Catholicism really is the only sacramental religion so we have a particular responsibility, I would say, for that sacramental dimension, which is grounded in matter. I mean, so we have a special responsibility to be cognizant of reality and of how we treat it. And one characteristic of reality is that it is not only instrumental. It's not only to be used for our own purposes. It has an intrinsic goodness, which the Pope emphasizes in the encyclical. And we realize that intrinsic goodness, especially when we have affection for it or care. So when we come to love a place or an, an animal, a pet or a plant, we're particularly affected by its beauty and we're, we're hurt if something comes along to degrade it or harm it in some way. And so we want to be very careful not to objectify reality and turn it into an object to be used and controlled. Instead, we want to reverence the intrinsic goodness of that reality. And another comment that's important here that I'll come back to later, there's also a kind of internal reality within us as human beings, because we're the only creatures with intellect and will. And so there's a link between this internal reality and our external reality. And our inner reality tends to be reflected in how we treat external reality. So here I think of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI when he said in his inaugural homily when he made, was made Pope, the external deserts are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. So the, we take matters seriously as Catholics, that exterior dimension, but we also need an interior conversion. And this is what Laudato Si is telling us, especially in chapter six. We're the only creature that possesses this interior dimension and we need to make sure we don't neglect it. And later I will be talking about some practices to feed that inner dimension. When we cre treat creation badly, it's an indication of something off balance within ourselves of a kind of contaminated or polluted internal ecology. And on the other hand, if our internal ecology is in order, that is reflected in how we treat our external ecology. We'll be more able to care for the world and the people around us. And also we, we need the internal motiv motivation, the care in order to sustain our acting. That's very important. Okay, and then my third point about integral ecology is relates to the fact that we live in a relational world. So everything in this world, all creatures are in relationship and are interconnected. And ecology is the study of those interrelationships. We human beings being part of creation are not exempt from this law of relationships. We can't live without relationships. 
And what are our key relationships? We know from our catechesis that love is the summation of the law. Love is the great commandment. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Laudato Si broadens this a little bit in a paragraph 66, which I just think is a crucial paragraph for the encyclical, for understanding the encyclical and practicing it. Our human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. And so here the, the Holy Father is expanding a little bit that great commandment to include the earth itself. So if you think of this trillium, that trifold relationship is core to who we are, relating with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. So putting integral ecology into practice is really caring for the earth. So listening to the cry of the earth, the groaning of creation, learning the grammar of creation. It means caring for the poor, for our neighbor, for the vulnerable, those on the edges, listening to the cry of the poor. And it means loving God. So spiritual, our prayer, our spirituality, our education, our catechesis. And the spirituality is essential because recall Cardinal Turkson's statement about Pope Francis um, in Laudato Si that caring for creation is an invitation to make our love of God show in what God has made. <clears throat> so our relationship with God anchors and guides all our other relationships. And just to emphasize here too, that <clears throat> being a Christian is not an idea. It's a relationship with Christ and with the risen Lord. That's what we're celebrating now during this Easter season. How are we transformed by our relationship with Christ? And then how do we go out and bring him to others and protect his creation? And so that's what integral ecology is all about. And we need new lifestyles that represent a renewal of those three prime relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. So now what I'd like to do is begin to look at some concrete, some strategies for living integral ecology in terms of those three categories of relationship. We'll start <clears throat> with our relationship with the earth and some ideas here that I thought might be of interest to you. One thing we can do is divest from fossil fuel companies. The University of Date and, and Georgetown University are notable in this, in this regard. We can um, prepare diocesan climate action plans and creation care teams. And the Archdiocese of Atlanta in Georgia is a wonderful example of this. They have prepared a Laudato Si action plan, which was authored by University of Georgia professors and staff who work together on this. So if you go to that website, you'll, you may find many ideas if you're interested in this. We can work on energy conservation or energy alternatives. And I, here I uh, have an example close to home to us here in Michigan, where um, St. Anthony of Padua Parish in South Bend, where Notre Dame is, received a grant from Hoosier Interfaith Power and Light to install solar panels on its gym roof and to put LED, LED bulbs in all its lights. There are rebates available that help you so you can convert whole buildings to LED lighting. We're doing this, in fact, at Aquinas College now. St. Anthony of Padua realized energy savings of about $1,200 a year from the solar panels and $13,800 per year from the LED lights in all its buildings. And then there's a beautiful story of alternative energy in Nebraska where the winters are cold and windy, uh, but for decades, a now retired farmer whose name is Russ Finch has been growing tropical fruit year round without an energy intensive heating system. He grows 13 varieties of citrus, lemons, limes, tangelos, tangerines, etc. He heats his greenhouse with a geothermal system that takes advantage of the consistent temperature of the earth, eight feet underground, where it's 50 degrees, 52 degrees Fahrenheit all year. 
And he devised a system for his greenhouse that pulls the air from underground and then just needs some fans to circulate the air. That's the only part that requires electricity. So it's very good for climate. It's very little CO2 is produced and it's very cost effective. He says that the greenhouse costs less than a dollar a day to run. And he's almost 90 years old now and he's still growing fruit year round, but now he's helping more people to do the same. And he sells geothermal greenhouse building kits so that other farmers can grow citrus in the snow. We can work on our waste. So recycling efforts at Aquinas, we have a zero waste uh, initiative, which has been very successful. We're about 70 to 80% uh, successful in uh, zero waste. We have single stream recycling, industrial composting and terracycling. So we can recycle also any of our candy wrappers and that sort of thing. So there's very little that needs to go in the trash. We can also do things like grow local food or start community gardens. We can work on habitat restoration and build sustainable landscapes or, or simply um, develop nature trails and outdoor activities to get people outside. And these last three, I wanted to share a few examples from uh, some work that we've done in Michigan along these lines. So we do grow a lot of our own food, not all of it, but you can see here our chickens, which we have for eggs, our cows, which we are grass-fed cows that we grow for meat. We have an orchard with apples and pears and plums. And we then process that food. And this is a little bit of the fruit of our land and of our hands from our animals. And there's a, a beauty, I think, in having the healthy food as well as in the work that's involved together with others in, in preparing and growing and preparing that food. We've also worked on restoring a, a prairie in an old hay field that was no longer being used as a hay field. And this has many ecological benefits. For example, we had a terrible problem with an invasive species called garlic mustard, which has entirely disappeared since we seeded the sanctuary with native prairie species. We also had some problem with flooding downstream because there's an old uh, water run that goes through this, this prairie field. And during the spring run, it would flood downstream. But since we've put in these prairie wildflowers, they hold the water and we have not had a flooding, flood down, uh, flooding problem downstream. It's very biodiverse, so increasing biodiversity with native species. And we named it deliberately the Laudato Si Sanctuary. Obviously, we reverence Laudato Si. And we use the term sanctuary for that it's a sanctuary for plants and animals. So bluebirds, bobolinks, meadowlarks. I even saw a pheasant uh, there, which is not common in Michigan, butterflies. But it's also a sanctuary for human beings. It's very beautiful. And it's a place where you can go and contemplate. And we do open it to the public to, to come in. And this can be done in your yard uh, as well. And then our nature trails, we have about three miles of nature trails and it's just a beautiful way to foster contemplation, to get exercise, to get children and others outdoors. And it's a, it's a corrective for all the screen time that, that we keep experiencing more and more and that has even more intensified during COVID. Okay, now putting integral ecology into practice in relationship to our, our care for others. And here I'd like to start by reading paragraph 139 from Laudato C. We are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. So we need, just like, as we need new lifestyles that, that respond to the cry of the earth, we need new lifestyles that respond to the cry of the poor and the marginalized, those on the edge. We need a renewed fraternity, and we need to bring those on the edge into the center. The Pope is saying this over and over again. Many 
eco practices actually do get groups working together. So, and here's just a few examples. A University of Notre Dame student pioneered this effort to install solar panels on a, a homeless day shelter. Many schools are teaching children how to grow food or having Earth Day celebrations. With the sisters, we have what we call work days every month where we invite people to help us work on the land. Here's an example from our apple harvest that we do every October. An example in Italy, and I hope this one is near and dear to the heart of Sister Angela Marie, her home country. Uh, this is a unique farm in, in central it Italy. And from the production of the ancient grain that they grow to how they treat their employees, everything revolves around the ethic of integral ecology. So farming had been in the family for generations, but in 1994, they decided to convert it to an organic farm. And Claudio, the farmer, didn't stop at organic. He wanted to go even further back to, to the idea of ancient grains. And so he, he became interested in them because they're created by nature itself and they're capable of defending themselves naturally from infesting weeds, from parasites. So you don't need chemical fertilizers or pesticides or herbicides. Little by little, as time went by, Claudio's farm expanded. And as a result, they needed new employees. And so he and his wife decided not to introduce machinery, but instead to use manual labor. It was also an ethical choice, they say, because they wanted to provide jobs to as many people as possible and kind of create one big family. And he also felt there would be no determined time schedules, but a project that they were working on together where everyone could complete their various tasks and chores serenely as their time was, was available and was most convenient for them. And this fostered the creation of like family bonds in which everyone is united even outside of work. And Claudio says now that rediscovering this human interaction was maybe his greatest success. It, it was so fundamental for him to redis rediscover this and not solely to produce in order to make money. And so he has become a champion of an economy that's at the service of the human person and not the other way around. Another uh, kind of global example is what's called the River Above Asia Oceanic Ecclesial Network. Raowen. This is a collaboration that's sponsored by the Federation of Catholic Bishops Conferences of Oceania, uh, Asia, the Philippines, and India. And what they seek to do is promote dialogue and collaborative engagements between the church, indigenous peoples, and local communities, youth, and other faith-based organizations as they're working toward caring for forest oceans and peoples. They called it the river above because the people share a common image of um, the river above, meaning the Pacific Ocean, which is the life which, which feeds all the rivers and seasons and lives of, of that area of Oceania and Asia. The Pacific Ocean is one third of the, our planet's surface and it's the largest climate determinant on earth. The surface area and the ocean currents absorb energy and they generate thermals and, and other air flows and form the weather patterns and storms that affect the whole globe and especially Asia and Oceania. The, this flow is, is life giving, but also life taking, especially as the climate is changing and, and resources are being exhausted. And it has many effects on the communities there because the welfare of the lands and peoples are so bound to the welfare of the, the ocean. So this network is seeking to serve the dialogue of integral ecology so that the human and natural ecology of the region are protected. And some of the questions they're asking are, how can the Catholic Church in Asia and Oceania listen to the life and concerns among forest and coastal peoples, enabling their voices to be heard? 
How can the church listen to the indigenous peoples, empower communities and young people? How can the church help transform the business world to move from an extractive to a circular economy? I thought this might be of interest to you since there's so much interest in Canada with the indigenous persons and their culture. Another more local example, again, another Italian example, there's a lot going on in Italy right now, of working with people at the edges and enhancing human ecology while protecting natural ecology is St. Paul the Apostle Parish in Syracuse in Sicily, Italy. It's a poverty stricken area. There's drugs, gangs, a lot of pollution. And the priest there and the, has gotten the young people of his parish activated <clears throat> and they're advocating for the local people and the protection of the local environment. They're developing shared spaces where all both rich and poor can congregate. And the priest as, tells his parishioners to love your neighbor means to leave behind a healthy environment and land to those who come after us. And he's now connected with a Jesuit effort called Connected Community. And so they're working on a political and a social analysis of the city, taking inspiration from Laudato Si and inviting feedback from the parish. And they've, they've integrated the, their environmental efforts with educational initiatives for the many youth who have dropped out of school because of the poor social conditions. So an amazing effort at um, protecting social ecology while also protecting natural ecology. And then finally, the third, so our relationship with God. It's about, so integral ecology is about also new lifestyles that put God at the center. And that's because to live integral ecology, we really have to, our efforts have to be undergirded by an interior ecology, an interior spirituality, and, and nourished by the sacraments and spiritual practices. Because without God, there's, there is the danger that, that our actions could devolve into kind of empty activism. But when God is there, we, for example, we can recognize that um, the difference between nature and creation. So in the secular world, the term nature is quite common. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the word creation has a broader meaning than nature because it has to do with God's loving plan in which every creature has value and significance. Nature is, is important in itself. It's a system which can be studied, understood, controlled, utilized, whereas creation can only be understood as, as a gift from the outstretched hand of our Father of who is so generous to us. And it's, it's a reality of love, the love of, of the creator. And so once also we start to think about the kind of world we're leaving to future generations, we look at things differently and we realize that the world is a gift which we've freely received and must share with others. And uh, the Pope says, the environment is part of a logic of receptivity. It is on loan to each generation, which must then hand it on to the next. So we have this broader vision of intergenerational solidarity and the logic of receptivity and gift so that nature, the intrinsic goodness of nature and its, its, its gift nature, we need to receive that and then share it with others. And in essence, the created world is around us speaking of the love of God for us. The goodness of creation speaks that constantly to us. And we need to celebrate God's love for us as manifested in creation through our prayer and liturgies. In the Grand Rapids, Michigan Diocese, we're having a special mass for creation on May 27th to honor the end of this, this fifth year anniversary. And the Vatican, the Castory for Integral Human Development, as part of its year of celebration for La, the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, is hosting Laudato Si Week, which will extend from May 16th to 24th this year. It's kind of the crowning event of the Laudato Si year. There are events scheduled for each day of the week, 
and I have a website link at the end of my presentation. You can register for the events. You can, I believe, even add, um, add your own events to, to the, the Let Auto Sea Week celebrations. And then the season of creation is another special way to celebrate with prayer and liturgies. This is an ecumenical celebration for Christians of many denominations. It actually began in 1989 with the Orthodox, the ecumenical patriarch Demetrio I proclaimed September 1 as a day of prayer for creation. Then the World Council of Churches made it a season beginning on September 1, the World Day of Prayer for Creation, and ending on October 4th, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of ecology. In 2015, Pope Francis designated September 1 as World Day of Prayer for Creation in the Roman Catholic Church. And now we also celebrate the season of creation. And all those Christian denominations who are involved are united around one common goal, care for our common home. And I, I thought some of the quotes of those involved in this season of creation were quite beautiful. They have likened it all of us coming together, a global Christian family, as like independent water tributaries of various sizes pouring into one large and mighty river, such as the Amazon. Each tributary has a name, but once a tributary has a name that flows into the river, it loses its name. That's what give the, gives the river its power. Christian denominations during this season lose their names and become one global Christian family because we're flowing into the big river that is the season of creation. We become a river that can really begin to wear on the way mountains and make big, big changes. So um, this is a very special thing that you might wanna participate in the season of creation. Last year, there were more than 1300 events like the one above in Nairobi uh, that were held throughout the season of creation. What we hope we can attain through our prayer and our relationship with God is this kind of serene attentiveness that is so beautifully referred to in the encyclical. And I'd just like to read this, this beautiful passage. This serene attentiveness is an attitude of the heart, one which approaches life with serene attentiveness, which is capable of being fully present to someone without thinking of what comes next, which accepts each moment as a gift from God to be lived to the full. Jesus was completely present to everyone and to everything. And in this way, he showed us the way to overcome that unhealthy anxiety, which makes us superficial, aggressive and compulsive consumers. And so, I think this is what we're, we're hoping we can reach. And this is the antidote for so much of this rapidified culture and even violent culture that surrounds us. Some other things that you might like to do to enhance your prayer. And these again, come from our land. We have a rosary walk, an outdoor rosary walk and an outdoor stations of the cross. And we recently uh, put in outdoor stations at the college too leading from the chapel to the dorms and through the woods. Another thing you might want to do, this is I have something I have been involved in with Salt and Light TV. So your Canadian TV station in Toronto. We prepared six half hour episodes in a DVD series, looking at six principles for why we should care for creation, ending up with integral ecology. And each episode has case studies where we actually traveled around the country and around Canada to get examples showing how people were living these principles. And it, we also have a study guide with the series. So it might be something you could take with a parish group. We did it in the Grand Rapids Diocese here. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about an examine, a spiritual examine that, that I developed that might be of interest to you. Now, an examine is a prayerful reflection on the events of the day in order to, to kind of reflect on your responses and to the realities of the day and to become more aware of God's presence in your life. 
And so as I was reading Laudato Si and trying to make it practical in my own life, I thought an examine would be really beautiful to develop out of this. So in the chapter four on integral ecology, there's one section on the ecology of daily life. And that is what I based my examine on those paragraphs 147 to 155. <clears throat> and as I read it, the ecology of daily life, which has to do with how we relate to everything in our daily life, revolves around three main areas, our physical spaces, our bodies, and our daily actions. So the examine revolves around those. <clears throat> and I did prepare a little prayer card which you could get from Sister Angela Marie if you were interested in practicing this. So my physical space is an environment. Well, what's important with this? We, we are in a new age. In, <clears throat> in the past, excuse me. <clears throat> in the past, <clears throat> we always intervened in nature, we have to. But it was as if we were receiving what nature ha had allowed it as if from God's hand, but now we are much more dominating. We are the ones to lay our hands on things, attempting to extract everything possible from them while ignoring or forgetting the reality in front of us. And again, that emphasis on reality. So with this part of the examine, to look at yourself at the end of the day and what do my, and to really examine yourself, what do my physical surroundings look like? Are they clean or messy? This could be your room, your dorm, your dorm room if you're a college student, your home, your yard. Uh, this photo here is all of us on a raking work day, which we usually do every November. Is it pristine or is it polluted? And then do, do, does my, my physical surroundings, do they break interconnections or do, do they promote them? Are they fragmented or do they give a sense of home, a sense of belonging? Do they bring about an experience of community? And again, <clears throat> with the exam is to be quiet for a few minutes, perhaps before you go to bed and really look at your day honestly and ask yourself these and you could journal about it if you would want. Then the second area of the exam my body. This is very important because thinking, I, I just love this is a very poignant phrase in the encyclical that thinking that we enjoy absolute power over our own bodies turns often subtly into thinking that we enjoy absolute power over creation. So we, <clears throat> we need to learn to accept our body, to care for it well, and to respect the laws within it, the limits that are there, the, the, the meaning of the body as a gift. And that's essential for any genuine human ecology which is essential for integral ecology. <clears throat> so here, asking ourselves, how do I treat my body and the bodies of others? Do, do my daily behaviors and actions put my body in a healthy or a diseased relationship with the earth? This middle picture, we, every year we have a trail run through our three miles of trails. Do, am I healthy? Do I eat well? Do I care well for my body and the bodies of other living things? So we have chickens, these are the little chicks a year ago. Did we care for them well? If you have a pet, do I honor the natural laws in my body and in the bodies of the persons to whom I relate? Do I respect the limits of the body? There, this is very important in terms of how we honor the, the moral nature, the moral law that's inscribed in our nature. And all of those conditions that are necessary for a dignified environment and for respecting others within that environment. And then finally, my daily actions. And here, I think this idea that a more contemplative lifestyle, that, that sense of serene attentiveness, the notion of a simpler lifestyle, less is more, this serenely present to each reality, how small it might be, rather than being distracted and not even being aware of the reality that's in front of us. That's what it really takes to get to human fulfillment and happiness. So in your exam and then where, from where do my daily acts flow? Is it a throwaway mentality? Because if I throw away things, I'm also likely to throw away people. Is it selfish or violent? A result of excessive consumption? 
And you wonder if so, this terrible violence that we've experienced in the past year isn't a result of some of this um, excessive consumption that, that kind of causes us to grab, violently grab and dominate. Or am I indifferent? What we are searching for is, you know, where were those moments when I really had that sense of attentiveness, that sense of love and caring? And we want to, to increase those moments in life, to increase our capacity for attentiveness and caring. Okay, now I'd like to just in this last part, look at a little bit of what the larger church is doing and in particular dicastery for promoting integral human development, which has been very involved in promoting Laudato Si. First of all, there's the Laudato Si pledge and the, the link is there through the Catholic Climate Covenant. Simply have you signed the pledge, which is I pledge to pray, live and advocate Laudato Si. And you can go to that website and make the pledge. Now, this year, the Laudato Si Action Platform is a major initiative that's, that's being undertaken, and that will be formally announced at the end of Laudato Si Weeks in May this year. And what it is, is encouraging these groups of Laudato Si families, dioceses, schools, universities, hospitals and healthcare centers, businesses and agricultural farms and religious orders to embark on a seven year journey towards integral ecology. And since last year when this was first announced, the dicastery has consulted across a wide cross section of the church on best how, how to best build this, put this into practice. So they, they came up with these seven kinds of institutions. And then they also came up with seven goals. Now, in the U.S., the Catholic Climate Covenant serves as the hub for the Laudato Si Action Platform. And as the Vatican has been working out the program's details, the covenant has formed its own working group to prepare to implement the, the platform in, in the U.S. I, I actually am on one of the work groups working on designing the platform for Laudato Si universities. So trying to build the architecture to make this happen, what would you need to do in year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Um, and so in the US, Catholics interested in becoming a Laudato Si parish or a Laudato Si family or a Laudato Si school or a farm or a business uh, can contact the Catholic Climate Covenant. The seven goals are actually how the uh, how we're going to measure integral ecology in within each of these those sectors. So in the universities, for example, how are we responding to the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor? Ecolo how are we demonstrating ecological economics, adopting simpler lifestyles, educating according to Laudato Si, developing spiritualities on campus that are ecological, have ecological foundations and engaging the community in this. So some of the things under each of these goals, so the cry of the earth would be things like greater use of renewable energy, reducing fossil fuels, efforts to protect biodiversity or guaranteeing access to clean water. It, each one will be adapted to whichever of the constituents are in the platform. Response to the cry of the poor would include things like defense of human life from conception to natural death, protection of, of uh, nature with a special attention to vulnerable groups such as indigenous uh, communities or migrants or children at risk. Ecological economics would be things like sustainable production, fair trade, ethical consumption, ethical investments, divesting as I mentioned, um, investment in renewable energy. Adoption of simple lifestyles would be so uh, reducing our use of resources and energy, avoiding single use of uh, plastic, adopting a more plant-based diet, reducing meat consumption, using public transport or avoiding polluting means of transportation. Ecological education revolves around redesigning educational curricula and reforming ed uh, educational institutions to 
in a spirit of integral ecology. And I think that's very important. We really need new curricula out there and getting young people and teachers and lead, educational leaders involved in that. Ecological spirituality is a little more general in terms of sort of recovering this, this vision of God's creation and encouraging more contact with the natural world, with the idea of awe and wonder, praise, gratitude, liturgical celebrations, ecological catechesis and retreats and that sort of thing. And then community engagement and participatory action would be like advocacy, people's campaigns, encouraging groups to get together to do, eco, do various eco actions and that sort of thing. As part of this, there will also be Laudato Si awards in the different categories. So awards for Laudato Si leaders, families, educational institutions, faith communities, action initiatives, economy or business or health or agricultural initiatives, communication initiatives. And they will, I, I believe awards will be offered in 2021. And so I think we'll, we'll stop here and these, these links could be available from uh, Sister Maria Sarah or Sister Angela Marie. And I just, I think I just want to close by emphasizing that need for internal conversion for an internal ecology and therefore the, the importance of things like the examine and the putting God in the center of our action. And then to just end with saying again the, the beautiful sentence that Pope Francis said upon the release of Fratelli Tutti, human fraternity and care for creation form the sole way toward integral development and peace. And so I think if we remember that, we'll really realize that that works personally in terms of our own human fulfillment and happiness, but also for us as a global community, as a Catholic community and as a global community, human fraternity and care for creation. They are the way towards integral ecology. So thank you very much. And I'm, I'm certainly open. I'd love to answer some questions if you have any. Thank you so very much, Sister Demi Marie, for a wonderful presentation. I truly appreciated that distinction between care and stewardship too, where care truly underlines uh, the element of relationship, uh, truly the love, the love that um, is in our hearts for each and every, every one of our, um, the men and women that we relate to, our love for creation. Uh, that truly underlies that desire for the goodness of the other and the goodness of um, the beauty that we see around us. And um, you showed beautiful pictures from our land in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. They're very dear to us. Uh, but I also wanted to say that Vancouver, it is a beautiful city. Our people here are surrounded by so much beauty in nature. And so I think that we do definitely here have the opportunity of that experience that um, Oh, the beauty of nature. So thank you for even helping us to get in touch with what surrounds us. Mm -hmm. um, and so sister is willing to take some questions and you can put them in the Q&A box that you find at the bottom of your screen. And um, a couple came in. And so maybe I will start with those. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, sister, how did you go about getting the zero waste on your campus? Were there specific steps that you took and was there um, support by the public services um, in your area? Yeah, it was, a, it was a process and it's still a process, but we have had great support. Now it's thanks to, there is a center for sustainability and they, you really need a champion. And so they were willing to champion it and we took it in steps. So the first thing was simply to get the single stream uh, recycling, right? So we, we got that in place um, and we had a donor who did give us some endowed funds so we could take the, the, the principal from the, the endowment and use that to, to get us the bins that we needed. Then we, we looked into industrial composting. So right now, we can take any kind of food. It doesn't, you know, when you do recycling at home or composting at home, you can't put in meat usually or, or milk products. But with, with the industrial recycling, anything organic can go in there, including even paper towels and that sort of thing. 
So uh, <clears throat> we do have to pay for them to come, but the amount that we're saving in the reduced amount of waste pickups that we have for our regular waste is, a, is able to, we're able to pay for it that way. So we started first with putting in that in some of the buildings and gradually now we've expanded all the buildings on campus now have bins that have the, the single stream recycling, the industrial composting. And then we learned about TerraCycle. You know, in a college, a lot of students eat candy bars and, you know, snacks and things. And a lot of that was going into the trash. And so there's a thing called TerraCycle and we do use a lot of student volunteers to sort through the different kinds of TerraCycle. They're, they're recycled into things like uh, different kinds of bags and grocery bags and that sort of thing. So we, we then added the TerraCycle after those initial phases. And then a couple of years ago, we did uh, speak more with our dining services and they came on board. And this is because really of the, the support of the president and the vice presidents of the college to allow us to move forward, as well as some of the funds that a donor, sustainability donor gave us. Now in the cafeteria, we, uh, everything is composted. So any leftovers are composted and we're also using compostable containers. So we, we have really reduced our waste in the cafeteria. So I'm very proud. It's, it's an amazing thing. I, I love the zero waste. We're also starting to use it in curriculum as an example of virtue, training and virtue because it's a great example for the students, kind of a hands-on thing of what it feels like when you're in the process of trying to get virtue, right? That at first you have to learn what to do, which bin do I put it in, all of this. Then once you start doing it over and over again, you, you're, you look for the bins and you don't want to just throw everything in the trash. Then when you go somewhere, and this happens to me all the time, I go somewhere and there's not zero waste, and I'm kind of like, oh, I mean, you know, how come there's no zero waste here? And I feel badly putting things in the trash. Well, that's what it's like when you reach virtue. You realize when you don't have it, right? And so I think it's a it's a great kind of example of that too. So, uh, and I'm certainly willing, willing to talk, you know, on a personal phone call or whatever, if, if somebody wants to start a zero waste program. And I can also put you in touch with our sustainability director. Thank you, sister. And the next question, in the context of world leaders who really are the movers and shakers, what actions do we see that have been taken in the last five years to indicate that our political leaders are really listening? Are you hopeful that new voices like Thumberger and perhaps Biden will be heeded to make a real change in the international level? Okay, so good question and kind of a, a key question. If, if I could preface it first by saying, um, I mean, this is, a, this is a big picture question. We, we can't get discouraged when we, if we feel that the world leaders are not listening because it also is very much a matter of our personal ecology too. So the Pope says in Laudato Si, you know, if someone turns down a light because they want to save energy and they really care, that is actually a noble act. So I always tell my students, because very often young people are, can get discouraged with questions like this. And I always tell them, but don't forget what's right here in front of you, the reality right in front of you, that that is actually a noble act. And if one person does that noble act and someone sees them and joins and then someone else and someone else, that's how we can maybe, if we get a million noble acts, now we're really talking something big, right? So, okay, so that's my, my long introduction. As for the world leaders, I have to give Pope Francis an amazing amount of credit because with, in, the, in the face of some serious criticism, he has actually put the Catholic Church in the center of some of these dialogues. He's got church leaders going to the UN to cop, the COP meetings. They are getting into the dialogue. And, um, and putting forth the kind of initiatives that he's proposing. He also did the um, uh, Economy Francesco meetings, trying to look at different models of economics and politics that are of service to care for creation and care for, um, for others. So 
I think we need the church to be and the church leaders to be in the center of this discussion. And he certainly has put us there. As for the secular leaders, many, many persons, because Laudato Si is written not only for Catholics, but for all people of goodwill. Many persons are reading it. And I've actually brought it up in many secular settings as well as some ecumenical settings and have found it a tremendous receptivity. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a, a great um, potential there the problem is always, you know, how do you get things to happen in these political realms? But I do know this might be encouraging. Uh, there was an initiative in, of the oil companies, and I heard about this through some friends of mine at Notre Dame. One of the business professors there uh, got this idea to try to convene the CEOs of the major oil companies at the Vatican to talk about what they could do to introduce alternative energies and to move away from carbon-based energy. Mm -hmm. He actually succeeded. They met with the Pope several times and it was a private meeting, but I mean, there have been short articles about it, but it was not published, you know, what was all, all the details of what was said. And actually my understanding is that a number of these CEOs have agreed because of these conversations, that they that they will work in a more concerted manner to move away from the fossil fuels and to 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 really invest and do research and development in the alternative energies. So you know you need people with guts too, or who are willing to push uh, push these the the secular leaders, but also to let them realize we have a tremendous resource in the church, and the church wants to be part of these things, wants to inform these things or dialogue with the experts, the secular experts. So I, I do feel hope. I feel there's a, a tremendous, and with the Laudato Si Action Platform, there's thousands of people involved in this. And I have hope that that will begin to speak to politicians. I think probably more parishes and dioceses and bishops conference need to press on this a little bit more with the politicians. Um, but and, and demonstrate some successes to show that this, that integral ecology is important and it can be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. hope that, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. And from a question of, from politics, um, I first of all wanna thank our healthcare workers that have been working so hard throughout this time of pandemic. And I, um, I say this because there is a question that has come in from someone who works in the healthcare business right now. And yeah. you know, go from the political realm to the really day-to-day, -day, day in and day out um, questions. And um, so thank you for asking the question and here it comes to you, sister. Um, do you have a suggestion about the surgical masks we are using right now to protect from coronavirus? Last week on Earth Day, we healthcare workers felt so guilty when looking in the number of masks tossed in the trash. If we work in COVID unit, we need to change our mask after every encounter with a patient. Can mm -hmm. you suggest for healthcare facilities what to do? And we also need to protect ourselves from transmitting the virus. So um, yeah. a very yeah, practical question for you. I know, and a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I don't know that there's any answers out there at this point. The, um, the working group that's working on the Laudato Si Action Platform for healthcare facilities is addressing some of these, is trying to address some of these questions. So how would a healthcare facility become a Laudato Si healthcare facility? I can only speculate some of these that are, that are actually cloth, masks or even the N95 masks could actually be shredded and composted, I think. I mean, we, we have to remember, we, we can't ask you not to wear the mask because of the health. I mean, you're, you're dealing with a, a health issue there. And incidentally, the pandemic is, uh, well, the rise in pandemics is due to ecological disturbances, right? So there's at the heart of this an ecological imbalance and you are out there on the front lines trying to help others to become healthy. So 
you've got to be protected. And it does seem like masks are very important for that. I wish that we could have a separate stream, a separate waste stream in the health facilities. And I'm sure they're dealing with this in those working groups for the platform where these masks could be, uh, I, I would say shredding could possibly work. Again, I'm speaking now, I, okay, I have a degree in engineering. I'm just, I'm speaking off the cuff here. I, I don't know if anything like that is actually being looked at, but um, to shred those and to compost them the composting process, if there was any chance of disease, it should be separate enough. And by the time the, the composting would occur, that should not, you know, there should not be transmission of disease through that. Um, so it's an excellent question and it needs to be asked. And I, it, I believe it is being asked in those working groups mm -hmm. or, and it's a seven year process. So because this takes time and the Pope wants us to, to take this as a journey, so we have to take one step at a time. And the first step is asking the questions. And then the next steps are looking at some answers and then is putting them into practice. Thank you. Thank you, sister. And the next question, how would you suggest that Catholics working in secular companies in the engineering, construction, and environmental consulting industry go about in promoting Laudato Si in their workplaces and with their colleagues? Okay, well, a good question, and it and it needs to happen, and it certainly can happen. In Grand Rapids, in Michigan, we have it tends to be because of a lot of uh, philanthropists who were very dedicated to the cause of sustainability. Many of the businesses here are very cognizant of environmental concerns, so. Um, there are certainly many examples out there. One thing I would suggest, so if you're in construction, in you, you could do a LEED certified building so you can promote that. And LEED certification involves all different facets, energy, uh, local materials, how you deal with your waste during the construction process. It's very detailed, very specified, it's widely used. So to advocate for that, and many, most of the construction companies around here and the architectural companies are very aware of it and will always present it to their clients as an option for, um, for the construction of the building. And so like on campus, we, we will not, we don't construct any buildings unless they have a, at least a basic LEED certification. The science building where I work, which we just finished constructing, we actually got LEED gold, we just found out, which was, tremendously exciting. And those, uh, one selling point in, so I think you need to maybe experience, if you haven't, you need to experience some of these environmental friendly practices and how advantageous they are even for human flourishing. So when you go into our LEED Gold Science Building, it is a tremendous building to be in. The, there's much more fresh air exchange. You, you're, there's a lot more light there's the there's no materials that are off gassing, say from the paints or the carpet, because we didn't use that kind of material. And you can tell the difference when you're in the building. It's actually a much, it's a superior learning environment for the students. It's it's easier for them to focus, a better, uh, better light for them to see. So the practicals and then demonstrating that economically it can be done. So Russ Finch with his geothermal energy. So we, we need to, if you're in a position where you are designing or in construction or in engineering, you need to, um, I guess, get a group together to actually propose these in the buildings. So we do need leadership and we need people to step up who have the professional expertise to actually put this in, in the buildings. If you're in uh, landscape, you could uh, do a lot with sustainable landscapes, with rain gardens. All of these things are pretty widespread. The technologies are well tested. So, to, but we just need to get them more, more out there, you know, more utilized. Okay, the next question. Once the solar panels are no longer usable, where do they go? What do we do with them? Yeah, so this is uh, the critique 
of solar energy? These are wonderful questions. Mm -hmm. It's tremendous uh, audience. Thank you. So they they are uh, they are disposed of. So they do become waste. Mm -hmm. However, solar panels can last for quite quite some time. I mean, several decades if used well, if kept clean, if um, if maintained well. So um, now if someone wants to go on for a PhD and do a little bit more work about how we could reuse the, some of the components can be reused, but what we can do with them to, so that it really is a circular economy. We need a lot more work done in how to develop circular economies for all of these technologies. Thank you. Um, sister, um, our attendee says, St. Paul in Roman eight writes about creation groaning and you um, have written extensively and also it's one of the section of your um, work with uh, salt and light. He mm -hmm. asks, uh, is it legitimate to apply his words to computers cell phones and other internet devices that transmit pornography causing this gift of creation to groan because of their misuse uh, as they lead to people away from God rather than to God. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, again, these are just marvelous questions. I wish I was there in person so I could actually be interacting with the persons asking the questions. Um, I don't know, well, I have seen this recently uh, done this connection between technology as creation. In my mind, I don't, I don't tend to think of it um, as creation when, when in Romans eight, but I, but I'm certainly willing to, to be countered on this, but in Romans eight, He's talking about creation in the sense of the theological sense of the term that creation as created by God, right? So um, the, our technological devices are not really creation. They're, they're made by humans, right? So I, I don't know why, but I, but I have heard others who are making that connection, but I tend to resist it, I think, because I don't want humans to take the place of God. So a, a, a cell phone is a an engineered something using elements of creation of course but itself isn't created by humans in the in the theological sense of created because humans are not we're not creators right i mean we're engineers we we take what's there and make it into something mm -hmm. so i think we have to be careful not to exalt technology too much um as much as i mean i i believe it's has a great power for good when used well. Now, the idea of when it's used poorly, I wonder if it would be more effective to think of it in terms of the technocratic paradigm that Pope Francis talks about in Laudato Si and of which, which he calls one of the roots of the ecological crisis. When this technology becomes so dominating and so um, in a sense polluted like you're saying, you know, used for such evil purposes. This, he says, this is really one of the key roots of the ecological crisis. And, and we just simply have to, to uh, root that out. <laughs> you know, so I, for me, it might, I find it maybe more helpful to think of it in that way. Technology itself, when used well, is not the technocratic paradigm. But certainly when, when it becomes over extremely dominating or takes the place of God in our life that we just, everything has to revolve around technology or when we, it's used for evil, such as with pornography or the, the so unfortunate uses in that way, that is the technocratic paradigm. And that is an indication that we are off balance as human beings, it's, it's a sinful condition, basically. It's a sinful use of technology. And that is something we, we really have to watch out for and we need to root it out mm -hmm. through, through a proper use of technology and also through balancing technology with relating to creation, you know, as in the natural world. 
where we can experience the laws of, of nature that are in that creation that's that in a way reorient us in in a way that our our man-made things can't always do that right because they're not made directly by god i mean so i again a wonderful question i'd love to talk further about it well here is another um wonderful question for you sister um, <laughs> I know these are following it's one great question after the other but um they're asking for recommendation for keeping Christ at the center and avoid empty activism. And you touched on it a bit, but it seems, it seems very concerning and easy to fall into it. Any suggestions yeah. on how to keep Christ at the center? Well, my, my first suggestion is the sacraments. I mean, I think going to church, really, and... Um, celebrating communally, celebrating the sacraments. There is grace in the sacraments and that grace sustains us in the face of the many distractions and the many things that wanna pull us away from, from Christ. The examine was another, I, I think, effort that, that I have tried to make because it's a sort of a small daily thing to have me kind of check in and, um, realize okay that was that response there was a little bit off how can i be better at that i i think also um these these examples of various kinds of liturgies and prayers that we need to practice on a regular basis the other thing i would say is to always when we're involved in actions and again, those of us who, you know, who so love to do these of caring for creation and justice and, and all of that, we do have that, that danger of falling into activism. If we constantly orient our thinking as doing this for the other out, out, of, of, out of sort of our relationship with Christ. And so he's walking along beside us on the road to Emmaus. <laughs> And we've been walking with him, and now we are going to welcome another into that. So we, we emphasize the love of the other and not so much the doing, doing, doing. Um, and I think sometimes we also do, we do have to slow down and, uh, and not take on so much. So I, I really was nervous tonight about mentioning a lot of ideas, thinking I hope people don't just get into this kind of rapidifying thing of having to do more and more and more, but rather focus on where you really feel your niche is and go from there. So it's a constant balancing act and it's hard for all of us. I, as Franciscan Sisters of the Eucharist, we have a lot on our plates and uh, we have to always bring it back to prayer and to community life. So I would think also in your family, in the encyclical, he talks about praying grace before meals which is such a beautiful small thing that we can do. But so taking that time for prayer, I think also praying the Angelus at noon, it just kind of checks you in the middle of your day of business. Okay, I'm stopping here and I'm going to just pray this Angelus for a minute and then go back. So it's, the Lord will give you the grace if you open up your heart in those moments throughout the day. Speaking about prayer and being centered in God, maybe we can conclude with this last question. Our attendees ask, which prayer could we pledge to support Laudato Si? Is there anything that you would suggest? Well, I love the prayers at the end of Laudato Si. There are two. There's one that's for Christians and there's one that's for non-Christians. They're both beautiful. I think as Catholics, you know, to, to pray those, they, they're just so beautifully said. And I, I think you can pray one or the other or pray them on different days. Certainly that I would suggest the Psalms. So if you pray the divine office, the Psalms are also beautiful and many of them are a praise. And of course, St. Francis's Canticle of the Creatures is another one, which, um, certainly during the season of creation to pray or in the time around St. Francis of Feast Day to pray that because that's just a, such a beautiful mm -hmm. celebration of how we are to, to care and to feel affection 
for Mother Earth and and Brother Wind and so. Thank you so much, Sister Demi Marie, for your presentation, for entertaining the questions, and just for being here. It's almost eleven thirty in Michigan, so <laughs> we're very very grateful. And um, we know that your love for creation is very deep and your desire to share that with others and to help us grow in our understanding and a love for the created world from human beings to nature all around us. And so tonight we also have Sister Maria Serra and she is working here at the Archdiocese is trying to implement uh, many of those suggestions that Sister has brought to us and she will share a little bit about what can maybe be done uh, by you here in the Archdiocese of Vancouver. So thank you, Sister Maria Sarah. Thank you, and thank you so much, Sister Damien Marie, for such a wonderful presentation and for giving us so much to think about and consider. Oh, You're wonderful. very welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so as Sister Damien Marie shared, um, there are many practical, possible ideas uh, of how to apply Laudato Si in our own lives. And without wanting to overwhelm you, we just wanted to add just a few more ideas. Most of them are pretty small and others may be more involved of how we here in Vancouver might live out in our own lives what we have heard about tonight from Sister Damien Marie. Um, one is just to, to consider starting a group in your parish or, or your local community that works on implementing small long-term lifestyle changes that help bring healing to our common home. And that can be in your family, among your friends, in your block, in your community, in your parish. Um, just one very simple example is um, implementing the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle uh, as examples. And we heard quite a few from Sister Damien Marie, use less plastic, just uh, commit yourself to using less plastic in your life. Um, that would be reduce uh, uh, for reuse instead of using one use items. And I know Sister Dean Marie mentioned this, choose to use items that you can reuse. Uh, of course, for recycle, you know, compost everything possible. And here in Vancouver, uh, the, the composting, we can compost everything. And, uh, you know, even meat in other places, we, we can't do meat. Here in Vancouver, we can. So it's it's a real gift and an opportunity to really enter into that. Um, another idea is to become an active member of Development and Peace Caritas Canada, DNP. Um, it promotes the support of impoverished communities in the global south, in the southern hemisphere of the world. And I, I think DNP, you know, challenges us to think beyond our own local communities. Uh, its efforts include addressing severe environmental issues within those countries that are in the global south. Um, so consider becoming a DNP rep at your parish by contacting our local archdiocesan DNP chair. Um, her name's Yolanda Broderick. I give you her her email address there, and you are going to receive these. And I believe Sister Damien Marie's list as well. Um, afterwards, Sister Angie Marie will send these to you. She'll forward these to you. Uh, for you women out there, become actively involved in Catholic Women's League or CWL of Vancouver or some other Catholic women's group that's active in striving for the development of social action, including promotion of the care for creation. Uh, join the city of Vancouver's Greenest City Action Plan. And that plan, which is quite extensive, um, it includes the goal of uh, Vancouver becoming a zero waste community by 2040. Uh, that sounds like a long way away, um, but you know, it's with such a, a, a large uh, population, there are many steps that need to happen in order to accomplish that, but that they even have it in their, in their plan is amazing. That's really great. I think it speaks very highly of Vancouver. Here's a simple one, plant a tree, plant two or 10 or start a vegetable or a flower garden. If you have any uh, issues or questions about that, give Sister Angela Maria a call. She, she knows how to do that. So she's done it where we live. So we've, um, we've got some very nice gardens uh, where we live. 
Thanks to Sister Angela Marie. Um, the next five resources that I give you are really about getting well formed in the Catholic teaching on care for creation with the goal of more effectively living a Catholic Christian way of living the integral ecology about which Sister Damon Marie spoke to us tonight. The document Laudato Si is fairly long uh, as far as encyclicals go. For those of you who may have had a hard time getting into it, here are five ways to help us better understand it. So there's a podcast out there and I, I give you the link to all of these resources uh, where Sister Damien Marie and Deacon Pedro Guevara Mann of Salt and Light Media discuss Laudato Si. So they break it down a bit. Um, and Sister Damien Marie and, and Deacon Pedro are the ones who uh, Sister Amy Marie mentioned the creation series, which I highly suggest. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And they they work together uh, to do that. And this podcast that I give you a link for uh, makes it easier to understand Laudato Si. Another resource is if you watch Understanding Laudato Si by Father Daniel P. Haran. He's a Franciscan, by the way, um, and he presents a series of 14 short videos, which are only 15 to 20 minutes each, explaining the complete document very systematically. He goes right through it. Um, the next one that I suggest is called Banana Peels and Climate Change, a daily examine. And I don't know if you recognize that last part, a daily examine, it's Sister Damien Marie again, uh, this time with Dr. Phil Sakimoto from uh, Notre Dame University. He used to be a NASA astrophysicist and they talk about why we need to make changes in how we care for creation. This incidentally, I was there, this happened at Aquinas College, uh, their presentation. And this was the first time I heard Sister Damien Marie's daily exam for ecological conversion. So uh, it's, it was very well done. And, and uh, I love the title, Banana Peels and Climate Change. I, I'll give you the link in there as well. Um, read a good summary of Laudato Si, such as the one that's offered by the global Catholic climate movement, uh, which Sister Damien Marie mentioned as well. Speaking of global Catholic climate movement, movement, one of the many resources they offer is a free training on becoming a Laudato Si animator. This helps train, inspire, and connect you with others who want to help care for creation. Um, it's a few weeks long, not too, not too, too long, but it really, um, it really challenges you to go more deeply into thinking about how you can really uh, live out Laudato Si and help others live out Laudato Si. So all of this is geared, these are just ideas. Um, even if you just take one of them, uh, that will really help you live into living Laudato Si. So thank you for the time uh, to be able to present this. And again, you will, you will receive this uh, as a follow-up from Sister Angela Marie. Thank you to both of you, Sister Demi Marie and Sister Maria Serra. So before our final prayer, um, I'd like to share with you some upcoming events during May. So May is a wonderful month to celebrate. It's the month dedicated to Mary. So the, the, Holy, the Holy Father has just actually asked today that we will all come together as a faith community and pray the rosary daily for the intention of the ending of the pandemic and for all the people who are suffering uh, because of the pandemic. So please join us, um, try to start that in your parish or pray the rosary within your family, but let's, um, let's do that as a community of faithful and, and try to ask and beg our Lord that he will take away this, uh, this pandemic from our world today, especially for all the people who have been suffering and who are continuing to suffer. So our next event that I would like to advertise is a wonderful opportunity for us to hear from our own Archbishop and Rabbi Infeld. The two of them, wonderful religious leaders of our um, community will discuss matters of faith and how their communities have been a source of hope during the pandemic. 
um, Archbishop Miller and Rabbi Infeld would also chat about how the restrictions on religious scattering have impacted their congregation. And this is on Wednesday, May 12th at 7.30. Faith in a Pandemic, a fire chat side uh, with Archbishop Miller and Rabbi Infeld. If you are interesting, uh, in, uh, interested in growing spiritually, there are two great opportunities coming up. The first one is on May 15th. It's Carmelite spirituality as a lay person uh, to try to help us grow in holiness by the way of the Carmelite spirituality and contemplative prayer. Uh, following the examples of the Carmelite saints as St. Teresa of Avila, St. John the Cross, St. Therese of Lisieux. So May 15th is a Saturday, an afternoon webinar. And then another spiritual opportunity, uh, this is Four and Four for You Spring Retreat is an online retreat presented by the Jesuit Spirituality Apostolate of Vancouver. And this will introduce the participants to the fundamentals of Ignatius prayer. Over a period of four weeks, so each week you will be assigned a prayer period, there will be a lecture, and there will be meeting one-on-one -on -one with a spiritual director. And this starts on May 24th. This is a great opportunity to truly be, int be introduced to the Ignatius prayer and spiritual direction. So a great time to, to look at the inner, as Cicer was speaking before. So take some time to, to discern if this is something that you would like to, um, to do, beginning on May 24th. Um, May, as we said, is uh, the year of Mary, and it's also in the context of the year of the family. So from May 10th to May 14th, please join us for the Joy of the Family Week. There are going to be many, many opportunities for us to gather together, opportunity for learnings, for celebrating, and for having fun. We'll have a children's question and answer with Archbishop Miller on May 12th. So you can look at our website and sign up for all of them or any of them. And then our last event that I would like to uh, advertise for you tonight is our next Into the Deep, St. John Paul II, the Pope of Dialogue and the Pope of Unity. And this will be our own Archbishop Miller who so much loves um, our church and the papacy is very, very well um, uh, prepared to speak on the, on the papacy of John Paul II, uh, Pope to whom he loved tremendously. And um, to speak about the ecumenical and interreligious dialogue and some of the contribution of our uh, Holy Father, uh, John Paul II. So please join us as you can. And um, to end our evening, I was thinking about Sister David Marie praying one of the prayers that you suggested from uh, the end of Laudato Si. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, and Father, we praise you with all your creatures. They come forth from your all-powerful hand. They are yours, filled with your presence and your tender love. Praise be to you. Son of God, Jesus, through you all things were made. You were formed in the womb of Mary, our mother. You became part of this earth, and you gazed upon this world with human eyes. Today, you are alive in every creature in your risen glory. Praise be to you. Holy Spirit, by your light, you guide this world toward the Father's love and accompany creation as it groans in travail. You also dwell in our hearts and you inspire us to do what is good. Praise be to you. Triune Lord, wondrous community of infinite love, teach us to contemplate you in the beauty of the universe for all things speak of you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness for every being that you have made. Give us the grace to feel profoundly joined to everything that is. God of love, show us our place in this world as channels of your love for all the creatures of this earth, for not one of them is forgotten in your sight. Enlighten those who possess power and money that they may avoid the sin of indifference that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which we live. The poor and the earth are crying out. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us to protect all life, to prepare for a better future. 
for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace, love, and beauty. Praise be to you. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for all of you for being here with us tonight. And thank you to Sister Demi Marie and blessings on your work. And Sister yes. Marie Sarah also. So many blessings to all of you. And we'll see you next um, session. God bless you all. Thank you, Sister Angela Marie. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.